Okay, welcome back from the long weekend. So uh, wonderful to see everybody here, and uh, certainly delighted to be able to introduce our colloquium speaker today, uh, Professor Devin Burr. She's now at the Northern Arizona University and um, is out here to be able to tell us a little bit about uh, both her research and uh, aspects of geomorphology, planetary geomorphology, and also the new Department of um, Astronomy and Planetary Sciences at NAU. So really, really wonderful that uh, you could make it here. So in terms of a bit of background as well, uh, Devon uh, obtained her, uh, her Bachelor of Sciences at the Naval and Political Sciences um, at the U.S. Naval Academy, and then served for uh, five years with the U.S. Navy. Uh, after that, um, did a Master's in Classical and Modern uh, Philosophy at St. J uh, John's College, and then uh, did a, a PhD in Geosciences and a minor in Planetary Sciences at the University of Arizona. So Vic Baker uh, was uh, uh, Devon's ad advisor in geosciences, and then in planetary sciences, um, Alfred uh, McEwen. Uh, after that, uh, Devon went to the USGS Astrogeology Center in Flagstaff, uh, where she, uh, uh, Devon was a, a, a Shoemaker Fellow, and then uh, went to the SETI Institute uh, as a research scientist. Uh, after that, Devon was a professor in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department at the University of Tennessee, and then just to recently moved to uh, uh, NAU, where uh, you're now a uh, professor. So welcome, and um, look forward to your presentation about geomorphology and the new department. Thank you, Christopher. Can everyone hear me adequately? Yeah, terrific. I really appreciate the invitation to come down um, and the introduction from Christopher and getting to talk to a variety of people today. It's been just a, a delightful day to be back um, and talking to to people I've known before and meet new people. Um, I've been having a wonderful day talking with people about areas of overlap. For example, Christopher and his student Joanna and our common interest in young volcanism on Mars and the Cerberus Plains. I'm getting to talk to Matt Chanaki a bit about the, our common interest in Aeolian studies, um, Martian dunes. What I'm going to focus on today is the work that really I've been taking to NAU, and that's pretty NAU-centric, so it's going to be a bit more focused um, maybe than the um, uh, touch points that I'd like to make with this audience, and so that I can leave time to talk about my new department. I have this long title up here. So the bottom line of the title is pretty obvious, right? NAU, Northern Arizona University, so four hours to the north, a mile higher in elevation, nice and cool, great place. Um, you all are welcome to come. I'm very happy to be part of what I feel like is kind of an exchange we have a bit going on between U of A and NAU. We got to have Christopher come up and talk to us a couple of weeks ago. Um, before that, we got to have Maitre Boys come and talk to us. I know that one of the new professors in my department there, Chad Trujillo, has come down and talked at Stewart. So it's really fun to be part of that exchange. The department is new as of J July 1st of this year. It was, up until that point, the physics and astronomy department. Physics separated and went off into a different college, College of Engineering. And astronomy became astronomy and planetary science. So that's why it's new, officially. But we did have that astronomy theme there before. Um, and they've been hiring in the field of planetary science kind of hand over fist for the last couple of years. Um, and I want to introduce some of those people, some of those new and old hires to you on the next slide. But most of my talk, of course, is going to be on planetary geomorphology, which is what I do, and then trying to link it to other areas of research within my new department. So this has been a, this putting together this talk has been a great opportunity for me to get to know my department a little bit better so that I can share it with you. So we do have a focus in this department, in the new Department of Astronomy and Planetary Sciences on surface processes. We have a number of us who do ex ostensibly, explicitly, planetary surface processes. Most of us work, uh, all of us work on Mars, and then one of us works also on Titan. We have a number of people who do laboratory studies. The one person that I'm not going to really be able to fit in today is Mark Loeffler, and so I want to talk about him here just briefly. He has this awesome laboratory where he irradiates ices in, under vacuum and is discovering new things that will help us understand icy bodies in the solar system. And I'm sorry I 
couldn't find a way to, to work Mark into the talk, but it's great to have him as a colleague, and we're already thinking together about Titan studies. Then we have this observational planetary science component of our, of our department, which, as I mentioned, was really sort of the, the bread and butter of our department. It's what we were when we were physics and astronomy, and it's still the main um, sort of the plurality of our department do this observational research looking at the surface processes, surface characteristics of small bodies in our solar system, asteroids, Kuiper Belt objects, comets, and so on. Um, we have a number of people who do spacecraft mission work, and I'll talk about that towards the end of the talk, and we're trying to expand in that area. And then one part of our department that I won't talk about but wanted to mention are our scientists who do exoscience and planetary formation. Ty Robinson has, has just joined us and is um, a, a terrific asset to our department in that area. And I'm sorry that I won't be able to talk about that in more detail. But I'm going to start out with what I do, which of course is geomorphology. So the study of, or the science of the shapes of landscapes or surfaces on other bodies. In this image of the Alaska North Coast, we can see a variety, a range of sizes of thaw lakes that are indicative to us of permafrost processes. There's some rivers here, some meandering rivers cutting across this permafrost terrain and then a, a delta towards the end there. So we can see permafrost, fluvial, deltaic processes or shapes. This image down here is from the Campo Piedra Pomez in Chile. The um, illumination on this image is coming from the upper right, so these features are shadowed on the lower left, so you should see these features as high standing, sort of limb escape or lens shaped features referred to as yardangs, features that are formed by abrasion of sedimentary rock by sand carried by the wind. Excuse me. We're going to come back to that in just a little bit on Mars. Here's an image of some glaciated terrain or some uh, terrain undergoing deglaciation at Mount Cook in New Zealand. Um, this is a, a, a extant glacier, a visible glacier where the ice is visible. This is some buried glacial ice and then um, a, a proglacial lake. Here's another one over in that area. And this is what the extant glacial ice looks like. You can just see the tip of it here and then some buried glacial ice and then the proglacial lake. Um, and I should say I had a great time talking to Jack Holt's group earlier today in their work on rock glaciers and debris-covered glaciers. All right, so these are types of geomorphology that we use in planetary science to understand other landscapes on Earth. So we do use these Earth landscapes as analogs. So we might look at a landscape on another planet. So this is on Mars now using an image from the context camera. And we can see in this landscape, first of all, maybe most ostensibly, especially since I've pointed it out with red arrows, we can see this sinuous ridge that tracks across this image from the upper left to lower right. And we can see that that ridge sits within an area that also looks like it has sort of a, the bounds of the area are about here. And, and there are these um, loops here that are filled with lineations, with, with uh, lower relief ridges within them. And then there's some terrain in the upper right and lower left that's kind of etched, maybe abraded by the wind. And it's not so much part of this main diagonal feature across the image. So we see something like that on Mars. And as a geomorphologist, I look at, we might look at as a community, we might look at terrestrial landscapes that appear similar on Earth in plan view. So here's the landscape that I think is in some ways analogous to this landscape on Mars. And here we see one sinuous uh, landform stretching across the image. And we also see these other loops, like we see in the image on Mars. And within those loops, we see these semi-concentric lineations. Again, so sort of what we see up here or up here. This is an image from the north slope of Alaska, just like we looked at on the first slide. And it shows a, a river tracing across the north slope and then places where the river has meandered or translated back and forth across the floodplain and cut off its original path and created these lakes, these loops of lakes that are extant now as, as lakes and will eventually sediment in and, and um, go dry. So these two landforms are similar in their plan view morphology, but they're distinct, surely, in their topography. Obviously, this is a river channel, so it's a negative relief feature, whereas this feature is a positive relief ridge. 
So I'll talk briefly about how terrain inversion works, how the inversion of the topography works. This is a, an inverted river valley in northern California called the Stanislaus Table Mountain. It's this brown feature that extends from the upper right to the lower left across your screen. It's a little bit hard, perhaps, to see that it's in inverted relief or positive relief. So here's an image from an airplane. And this notch here is this notch here. And hopefully this perspective view can help you see that this is indeed a ridge. This represents a Miocene river valley that was filled in with lava about 8,000, 8 million or 7 million years ago. And then the surrounding landscape was eroded probably during the last glacial maximum when a lot of our ocean water was tied up in ice caps and the ocean level dropped and enhanced the erosive capacity of the river. And so this more resistant lava now is a ridge standing above the surrounding landscape. So Robert Jacobson at the University of Tennessee studied inverted deposits, fluvial deposits on Mars, like we've seen earlier in this presentation. And this is his diagram for how the fluvial features, the inverted fluvial features formed on Mars. So first there was the fluvial feature itself, hydraulic activity. These lines here indicate the past location of the river translating back and forth across its floodplain, as meandering rivers do. Then there was sedimentation either during the flow, during waning flow, or perhaps after the flow by the wind or mass wasting. Then on Mars, there was this component of burial where, at least in the region that we were studying, the region that Robert was studying, there was some kind of overburden deposited on the fluvial landscape, some kind of aeolian deposit or volcanoclastic deposit on the fluvial landscape that preserved it. And then eventually, both that um, overburden and the surrounding terrain was eroded and left the indurated or stronger inverted or stronger fluvial deposits in inverted relief. And these few little yard angles here indicate the remnants of this overburden that was removed. So um, on Mars, we think we had induration by cementation, and then there was aeolian abrasion that exposed and exhumed and inverted the topography on Earth. In this example over here, we have induration, but it's by lava infill. And then the mechanism for erosion was the sea level drop. But it's kind of the same principle to get inverted terrain. You need something to indurate the terrain and then something to erode it. So going back to Mars, so this is sort of where we were before. Um, you can see it's in a slightly different location than the previous image we were looking at. But you can see the components of everything that I just laid out on the previous slide. You can see these uh, yard angles up in the top third or quarter of the image. This is, again, these um, deposits that have been emplaced and then eroded by the wind, by abrasion by the wind. And you can see that they're being removed back from and sit on top of this terrain here, where we can see a sinuous ridge. And that, that sinuous ridge sits on top of a broader platform that has, it's a little bit harder to see here that I've zoomed out than it was on the previous slide, but it has these loops here that do have some semi-concentric ridges in them. And there are a few more down here. So loops that we interpret as these um, remnants of a meandering channel. And then there's lower terrain in between here. So we interpret this sinuous ridge as a channel and then the broader platform that it sits on as the floodplain that was formed, probably not by this channel, but by a pre-existing channel. Because this channel sits on top of the floodplain, which doesn't work sort of stratigraphically in a fluvial system. And then all of that has been exposed from beneath this overburden of material that's now forming yard angles. So how do meandering channels form? It's pretty easy for me to say, oh, this is a meandering channel. We know how meandering channels work. Maybe not quite so much here in the Southwest, but where I used to be from in Tennessee in the East, we know a lot about meandering channels. The Mississippi River is meandering, for example. On Earth, we think that meandering channels form in the presence of vegetation. That is to say that meandering channels require some kind of bank strength to keep their plan form narrow. So when we look down on them, they've got a narrow, single plan form. If there weren't the bank strength there, then for every flood, whether it was a seasonal flood or a decadal flood, 
If there weren't the bank strength, then that flood water would break through the channel banks and create a braided plant form. So something that had many channels with mobile bars in between those channels. So to get meandering, we need bank strength. And on Earth, that bank strength, we think, is associated with vegetation. What I'd like you to take off of this slide, which is a little bit busy here in the middle, is simply that in an absence of vegetation, sort of whichever line you pass, whichever line you follow, you get down to a braided or low sinuosity fluvial style, which is to say the style where there are a lot of different channels and they're separated by mobile bars of sediment. You don't get this confined meandering channel like we see over here on your left. So that's the theory. What do we see in the rock record? We see something that seems to coincide with this theory in the rock record, which is to say, with the rise of rooted plants here in the early Devonian, we see associated, sort of at least when this paper was published almost a decade ago now, we saw an associated rise um, or greater prevalence in the rock record of meandering deposits, which is this sort of hashed symbology, and lateral accretion sets, which are sets that are laid down, stratigraphy that's laid down when the river meanders laterally across its floodplain. So roots, meandering, seems to make sense. Obviously, the question is, how, does, how do we then account for meandering deposits on Mars? So either the interpretation that I've given you is wrong, they're not meandering, or there's some other way to form bank strength on Mars. So we, uh, um, with the leadership of a student, Nyo Matsubara, who is a former PhD student with Alan Howard at the University of Virginia, we examined what we thought was a terrestrial analog for rivers on Mars, which is to say a meandering river that formed without rooted plants to see if we could determine another origin for bank strength. Uh, the field location was in northwest Nevada in the Black Rock Desert. This was a place in the Basin and Range province where in between the ranges, the basins were filled with lakes during the last glacial maximum. Now, of course, they're dry. And this is what the floor of that um, a pluvial lake looks like. That's, this is located where the red bar is up here. And you can see that there's a river tracing across this location in this basin. And you can see that also the river has changed its position. We can see a lot of old traces showing where the river used to be. So the river is actively meandering, which is what we need. Just a plain sinuous river won't do. It has to be actively meandering for this investigation. And also, I can show you this image from the ground showing that, in our view, there was not a significant influence of vegetation. There are these rooted scrub brush, kind of tumbleweeds here, that are um, visible around the um, packers that took us into our website. This is Yo Matsubara for scale. But there wasn't significant vegetation with, with any deep penetrating roots at this location. And certainly as we got closer to the river, I don't know actually if it was because of the salts or what, but the vegetation thinned out even more. So there was little vegetation. There was a steep cut bank. So this is a fairly narrow, if you're not used to looking at fluvial channels, I'll just tell you this is a fairly narrow channel and it's got a cut bank in the back here. So we can see that the river is actively, because of the steepness of this bank, the, the close to vertical profile, we can know that the river is actively meandering into that bank, cutting into it. And also that the bank has strength, which is what we need. We need the strength. We need to find out what the mechanism is producing strength in this situation. Again, Yo for scale and a couple of colleagues. Here we can see a place where there was the former location of the river in this um, channel bank here, and that it's actively meandering. And we can get a hint at some of the clays in these desiccation cracks. And more evidence for clays are the clays. I've, I've walked across the river now. And we're taking data with a, a total station, taking topographic data. And you see, can see that the clays um, have caked my legs up to about my knees. So, so ample clays. That was essentially our hypothesis for what provides strength. And we think that our field work did support our, our hypothesis that clays provide bank strength, at least in this location on Earth. 
That cut bank that I told you about is shown, the data from that cut bank are shown here in the blue. It says cut off deposits here, but it's from a number of different cut banks like that. So banks that were exhibiting strength with their near vertical um, uh, slant or tilt. And you can see if you look on this ternary diagram where clay is increasing towards the apex of this ternary diagram that here the deposits from or the, the samples from the cut banks were um, almost entirely clay, almost 100% clay. There was clay throughout the system, but the banks that had the steepest tilt to them were the most clay rich banks. We could also see in the system that clays draped the bed forms on the base of the channel. So the clays were prevalent also in the water flowing down the channel. And that when we look at them under magnification, we can see that um, there are a few areas without clays, but the dominant um, appearance of these sediments under magnification was that they were draped with clays. Yo also did some experimental um, tests that I'm not going to show you, but those also supported the idea that the clay had sufficient strength to hold up that cut bank and to provide the necessary cohesion to promote meandering. So we think our hypothesis of clays to provide bank strength was supported here in Nevada. If we go back to Mars, we know that clays are found on Mars. And I've just highlighted the name of my new colleague at NEU, Christopher Edwards, who participated in this work. The clays here are labeled as phyllosilicates down at the bottom. So all the blue dots here are places where we found clays on Mars. So we know clays are found on Mars. Um, the reason, the, the region that I'm looking at with these meandering deposits is right here. So there's not a whole lot of clays that have been detected there, but it's a very dusty region. And so I generally attribute that to the, the um, prevalence of the dust that pre prevents really robust spectroscopy in this region. So we have clays on Mars, and clays are, we think, a reasonable, a plausible mechanism in this location on Mars where we're working. So those fluvial deposits, those meandering inverted fluvial deposits that I showed you at the beginning of the talk all come from within this black box. And this black box is in the westernmost part of the Medusa Fosse formation, which is outlined here in red. This is from a paper by Laura Kerber, where she did this great study of different um, inverted um, uh, impact craters, actually, um, in the Medusa Fosse. And so I've taken her figure to show where we're working here in the westernmost part of the Medusa Fosse. And the Medusa Fosse are interpreted to be a volcanic clastic deposit. Volcanic materials tend to weather to clays in the presence of water. So the fact that we have a volcanic deposit and we have water flowing over it um, give us the scenario that we need, the two main ingredients that we need to produce clays. We also need a certain amount of time but meandering rivers connote a certain amount of time. They connote this translation back and forth across the floodplain so that there's been persistent discharge. So we think we also have the time necessary to form clays. At least it's a plausible scenario. So just to remind you, this is what we were looking at at the very beginning. This is an inverted fluvial deposit on top of a, of a floodplain that has not yet been inverted. It, sits, it still sits within its surrounding terrain, but it's on its way to inversion. And our interpretation is that this is an inverted meandering deposit that was formed in the presence of clays. Now that study was enabled in part by field work. I'd like to just touch on some of the other um, field investigations that we have going on in our department. There are a number of them. I'm just going to highlight a couple. So um, Mark Salvatore in our department travels to Antarctica every year. And he's shown here um, a picture of the Beacon Valley in the McMurdo Dry Valleys of Antarctica um, in comparison to the site of the Mars Science Laboratory, MSL. And he does terrestrial analog work in Antarctica to investigate weathering under the very cold and dry conditions that we find on Mars and are also found in the dry valleys of Antarctica, and also to investigate habitability in the dry valleys and to think of the astrobiological potential on Mars. And then just as one other example, I'd like to hi highlight Christopher Edwards' work. He's um, doing a study, a thermophysical study, in uh, the Mojave Desert 
looking at what are um, seeming analogs, morphologic analogs of recurring slope lineae on Mars. Obviously, recurring slope lineae features that were discovered through the high rise instrument in this department. These long, dark features that form and then fade and then form again and then fade. And Christopher thinks that he sees analogs for those in the, in the Mojave Desert and is exploring their habitability, most um, importantly, their soil moisture content to help us think about what the soil moisture content might be for RSL on Mars. All right, so going back to Mars um, and the same region on Mars, this is the area of the black box that we looked at a couple slides ago in the far western part of the Medusa Fossa Formation. And this is the region on Mars that has the densest population of these inverted fluvial deposits. There have been a number of inverted fluvial deposits discovered in, in other places on Mars, and I think there might be a paper coming out on that soon. Um, but this, to date, has been the densest known, um, or the, the greatest density of inverted fluvial deposits that have been published. And I want to just talk a little bit about the different morphologies that we see in this region. So first we have these meandering deposits, and we've already talked about those. We have a single thread channel on top of them, and then below them we have loops of less um, of inverted deposits, but in less relief that they sit on. And we've already talked about how our preferred um, interpretation is that those are inverted meandering deposits. We have other deposits that are similarly broad, um, like the platform I showed you earlier, but that don't have the loops on them. They don't have those big sweeping loops with the semi-concentric ridges inside those loops. So we think those are actually a different, a different beast, that they're channel fills instead of meandering deposits. But again, they have that narrow or that thin feature on top of it. Lastly, we see features that look to us like inverted uh, alluvial fan deposits. So where some ridges come together, there's a short apex, and then they diverge again. And so we interpret those as fans. So we have meander deposits, channel fills, alluvial fans. We also have this one long guy in the middle, Aeolus serpens, the serpent of the winds. It's not clear to us why Aeolus serpens is there but it looks like some kind of a medial, a medial channel, and there's a, there are a number of possibilities as to why, what caused it, but that's, that's another story we're still working on. Now, in these four black boxes are places where Robert Jacobson looked at the superposition relationships among these different types of fluvial morphologies and was able to create some stratigraphic columns for us, or some... Uh, correlation columns for us. <clears throat> Here's that box we were just looking at with those four black boxes on it, and here are Robert's four stratigraphic columns. I'd like to just focus in on two aspects of these columns. One is the pink units at the top. The pink connotes fans. The fans are fewer in number. In fact, they're the fewest in number of all the different types of morphologies we have in this region. They have a limited geospatial distribution. They're only found in the northwest and in the southeast. They're not found in other areas. Um, and they connote episodic discharge. So fans form in a place where there's significant relief. There are periods without discharge where the material in the basin is undergoing weathering. And then where there's a significant discharge that moves that weathered material out of the basin into across the, the um, margin of the relief and, and down into forming a fan. Then at the bottom, I'd like to highlight these blue units. And those blue units are those broader deposits where, at least in the southeast area, we saw the scroll bars on top of them. We saw those big loops with those ridges, those semi-concentric ridges, those scroll bars inside them. And so we interpret those as meandering. There are many more of these blue deposits. They occur more or less throughout this region. So there are more of them in number. They have a wider geospatial distribution. And they connote a persistent discharge, a discharge that's continuous enough to form these laterally migrating channels, these meandering deposits. 
So you can see, if you put those two things together, you can see that down at the base of these stratigraphic columns, we had more persistent discharge, a wider spatial area of, of persistent discharge. And up at the top of these strat columns, we had only um, limited discharge, and that discharge was episodic. So what we infer from this is that there was a change in climate over time from a climate that promoted meandering to a climate that, that enabled only fan formation. And so we feel that in this, in this area in Mars, we're seeing essentially the um, kind of a compacted version of the, the fluvial history of Mars going from what we think is the Noachian Hesperian boundary up into the middle Amazonian. We can't get age dates in this area from crater counts because it's so heavily eroded, but we think the stratigraphy provides us a nice encapsulation of the fluvial history of Mars. And our colleague at University of Chicago, Edwin Kite, and other people have published a similar story. Uh, I guess I should say also, whoops, I mentioned up here drying over time or, and or less clay. So the meandering deposits form in the presence of clay, as we just talked about already in Nevada. The difference here between this symbology and this symbology is that these fans formed, we think, through sheet floods, which has a different water ratio, um, a higher water to sediment ratio than these fans down here that we think formed through debris flows, which has a lower water to sediment ratio and tends to form in the presence of clay. So down in this region, both because of the morphology of the fans that we think formed through debris floods and the meandering morphology that requires bank strength, we think there is more clay down here in this region than up in this region, and we attribute that to more weathering here, possibly because we're just north of the dichotomy boundary here, and there might have been more orographic precipitation. So it's kind of another part of our story in this region. All right, so there are a number of different landscapes in here. I've just touched on a few. We want to synthesize these all into a coherent history. And so for that purpose, we're making a geologic map. This is something that's exciting to me. Um, it's my first geologic map. And um, it's enabled, it's been enabled really, or been um, facilitated by the fact that I now get to be up in Flagstaff, where there's the USGS Astrogeology Branch, which are, is really the nexus or kind of the headquarters for producing geologic, planetary geologic maps in the US, at least ones that are, are published um, as official USGS maps funded by NASA. So this is my geologic map. The thing that I'd just like to, or at least in its current, um, its current um, embodiment, it's still going through some minor changes. But the white diamonds are all the inverted fluvial deposits that we've been talking about. And um, these are the southern highlands, so we're just north of the, of the dichotomy. This is where we saw a lot of clays and fans, debris flow fans. And so this is what I mentioned before, that something that's really interesting to me, that's been an enticement for me and, and a um, source of expectation for me at NAU is getting to work more with the USGS folks at the Astrogeology Branch and facilitate, do what I can to work with them to facilitate the production of more planetary geologic maps. There's, I was talking to a couple folks earlier today about the significant energy barrier that there is to get over learning ArcGIS and then making the map. I think the maps have a real, um, a real place in our community to let us see it in a snapshot or in one view the geologic history of an area. And so that's something that is becoming a new focus of our new astronomy and planetary sciences department. We do have a few other mapping investigations going on in the department. They haven't been turned into official maps yet, but there's you know, always that hope. And I'll just point out a couple. Um, Christopher Edwards is working with the Mars Science Laboratory team and their data and doing some, his students anyway, doing some mapping and some ground truthing of orbital data using MSL. And our current department chair, Nadine Barlow, works on Mars craters and central pit craters and does mapping of those craters to try to help us understand how these pits form in the middle of these craters. We see central pits within craters across the solar system from Mercury out to the icy satellites. Um, but it's still a conundrum as to how they form. And so that's something that Nadine particularly studies. All right, 
Moving on to Titan. So we can do geomorphology, geomorpho geomorphologic investigations on Titan. Um, Titan to the eye is just this orange ball of, with this, this thick haze on it. This is Saturn in the background and its ring plane. Um, we have images, a sequence of images. This animated GIF from very early on in the Cassini mission shows a three-step sequence where clouds formed, moved, and dissipated. Form, move, dissipate, form, move, dissipate. And so that was early evidence of something that we understand much better now, that Titan has this dynamic volatile cycle of, of hydrocarbons, of methane, Ethane doesn't have maybe quite the, the volatility, but there's a lot of methane in the atmosphere um, in this dominantly nitrogen atmosphere that seems to form clouds, move, and then rain out liquid on the surface. So just like Earth, Titan has a dynamic volatile cycle. Um, but it's forming, this, this volatile cycle is obviously operating under very different conditions. So the couple things I'd just like to point out are the different temperature on Titan, so 94K, that the crust is made up of water ice, and that the liquid, again, is methane that's flowing in the lakes and raining out of the atmosphere on Titan. But we do have the components for generating fluvial processes, fluvial landforms on Titan. And so in this paper, um, my colleagues and I were trying to sort of wrap, my, wrap our thinking around the diversity of the fluvial landforms that we saw on this body. We see both radar dark fluvial features, like here. Um, with the expertise, the radar expertise in this department, you all understand well that dark in SAR for a similar dielectric constant means smooth. And so the idea is that these dark river valleys are draped with fine sediment, probably some kind of organics. And we can also see, it's a little bit hard in this image, but you can see some radar bright fluvial river valleys um, up on, uh, in the image on the upper right. And the brightness means that they have some kind of roughness in, in them on the scale of the radar wavelength, which for the Cassini radar was about 2.2 centimeters. Then we have some, some wider dark features here and some wider radar bright features here. We have some winding radar dark features here and some winding radar bright features here, and so on. So a lot of variability, a lot of variety in the landform, very interesting. Now the, the synthetic aperture radar data, the SAR data from Cassini, had at, at best about 350 meter per pixel resolution, and at worst, 1.7 kilometer resolution. We didn't feel confident that we could really say too much about what these different landforms were telling us. So instead, we started out doing a, uh, an investigation of the drainage morphology, where we didn't have to have the resolution to see very clearly what was happening in the channel. We just needed to see where the channels were, where the river valleys were. So we did this investigation into the drainage morphologies. and. If, some, if there were drainage morphologies that were below a certain size, then we didn't analyze them, and that's what all the white stuff is, stuff where there just wasn't enough data for us to come up with a, a robust result. But we used an, um, uh, an algorithm that had been developed for Earth to distinguish among, for larger drainages, to distinguish among dendritic, parallel, and rectangular or rectilinear drainages. Here's some examples of three of those drainages. Dendritic drainages just mean drainages that are branched. They have a, an acute angle, and it tends to be the type of drainage that forms over a homogeneous, moderately sloped substrate. Rectilinear drainages tend to have right angles at the, where the branches of the, of the um, drainage morphologies, of the drainage links join at obtuse or right angles, and they tend to form on Earth in the presence of structural control in the subsurface. And then we have subparallel drainages, and those tend to form where there's a steep slope and under conditions where there's topographic control. There are different types of drainage morphologies that I'm showing you. There are another two or three or four types, but we didn't have the resolution or the data quality to be able to distinguish among those. So we felt we could distinguish among these three. And here's some examples of how they look on Earth. What we found was that we had um, primarily rectangular morphologies. 
about 50%, 55% of the, the drainage morphologies that we were able to analyze on Titan came out as rectangular. Rectangular morphologies, as I mentioned on Earth, tend to form in places where there's tectonic control in the subsurface, maybe faults or planes of weakness in the subsurface at right angles. So this is what we suggested was the cause for our re results. We also mentioned in the paper that rectangular drainages also form where there's dissolution in the subsurface. They form in karst terrains on Earth. We weren't able to make that call on Titan, but that points to the need for more studies as to the geochemistry, the cryogeochemistry that goes on on Titan. There's a lot of work in this area being done out of JPL on Titan, and there's also work being done in the astrophysical laboratory that we have at NAU and our department at NAU with colleagues from Lowell Observatory. So like the USGS, Lowell Observatory is just a couple miles up the road from NAU. It's great where we have this nexus of a variety of planetary science organizations and astronomy organizations around. Um, Will Grundy from Lowell, Steve Tegler from uh, my colleague at the department and a student here are working on setting up the ice lab which has now been set up for half a dozen years. This image is a little bit old. I want to highlight also Jennifer Hanley, who's at Lowell, but does extensive work in this ice lab and is a great colleague to have in, our new in my new department. Just as an example of the type of work they've done, Jennifer works a lot on lakes on Titan and trying to understand how the, the ethane and methane and liquid nitrogen and propane, how those different components interact with each other in the lakes. The example that I'd like to show also, though, um, or instead, from the ice lab is this very recent paper just came out a couple of, I guess a couple of months ago um, in Astrophysical Journal, Astronomical Journal, in which um, the, my colleagues in the ice lab showed that there was an IR absorption, which they also see in telescopic data of Triton, that they attribute to one photon exciting two different adjacent molecules. So exciting both carbon, a carbon monoxide molecule and a nitrogen molecule. So something that um, hadn't been discovered before. They saw it in the lab. They saw it in observational data. And so this is a, a new insight that can help us understand the compositions of other icy solar system bodies. So just this really nice synthesis of lab work and observational work that we have at NAU. Meanwhile, back on Titan, so going back to Titan, um, we have some synthetic aperture radar data of Titan where the fluvial features look really bright, brighter than maybe it seems they should or brighter than we expected. Elise Legall and her colleagues did some studies in which they inferred that the brightness of these features was most plausibly explained by retro reflectors in those fluvial outwash planes. So those retro reflectors, they hypothesize, are spherical or semi-spherical cobbles on the size of or larger, better yet if they're larger, than the radar wavelength, which again is about 2.2 centimeters for Titan. And so this was their hypothesis for why we get these radar bright returns, and it's Plausible, they also cite as, as a plausibility argument the fact that the Huygens landing site showed us a number of cobbles, rounded cobbles, sort of uh, subangular to subrounded cobbles of a, of a uh, relevant size, of a reasonable size to produce an enhanced radar return. So from that suggestion, um, came as was actually published by Marty Tomasco in, in this department way back at the beginning of the Cassini mission came the idea that there are fluvial cobbles on Titan. Let's see if I can find my cursor. Um, so this worked when I was trying it, but now I can't find my cursor. All right, um, I think what I, yeah, if you have no, okay, brilliant, thank you. Okay, let's see if this works for us. 
Okay, so this, this video um, is just an illustration of how sediment is transported in rivers on Earth. The sediment that we'll see in this video, which I'm only going to show for about 30 seconds, but just to give you an idea, the sediment that we see in this video is rounded. You can see that some of the grains are quite rounded. Some of them are more subangular. Um, they all have the appearance of having been transported some distance. They don't have angularity that you would expect in a fresh landslide deposit, for example. It's not known if this sediment was rounded during transport in this river. The sediment could be a deposit, a fluvial deposit from a much earlier episode and then been recently mass wasted into this river. I'm not making any claims for how the sediment got as rounded as it is, but I'm simply offering this as, a, as an illustration of how sediment, how cobbles move, how large sediment moves in a fluvial context. So this is the idea that's been suggested for tightening that um, we get that we get sediment that's rounded on Titan through transport in these fluvial rivers and these outwash plains or, or valleys, river valleys. And so to investigate that question, to see the plausibility of that question, um, we've done some work. Tony Maui, a graduate student of mine now at NAU, and Joe Levy at Colgate University. Um, and I have created this Titan Tumbler, Titan Tumbler 1.0, where we've done roller mill experiments cooling the tumbler down with liquid nitrogen. There's a bath of liquid nitrogen here at the bottom. Um, this is looking inside, obviously, of this tumbler. And you can see the, the three centimeter class that are tumbling around. Um, so tumbling class in this Titan tumbler and then periodically measuring the mass loss, the roundness, the roundness index, and the size of these, the sphericity of these. So um, we put in cobbles that look like this, where we freeze them. This is deionized water that we freeze in ice cube trays. And then after a certain amount of time, we measure them and we get things like this. And then we take images of them and we get their roundness index and so on. And then we put them back in and we tumble them some more. Um, it's a little laborious. Um, we're looking to improve our, our methodology. But to date, we get results that look like this. So the green squares are our Titan Tumblr results. And then these other symbols are results from the literature from people who have done the same work with terrestrial materials. And you can see that all of these data sets have kind of a similar slope. But the Titan Tumblr data sit a little bit above the others. We need to normalize for the offset at the beginning. We've done that in a different slide that I, that I can't show just at the moment because we're still working on some other questions with the data on that other slide. But even when we normalize for that, the different starting masses and circularity, I guess it has the same mass, but different starting circularities, the Titan Tumblr results tend to sit a little bit above the terrestrial results. So the suggestion from this is that the, um, the, the sediments on Titan might round faster than sediments on Earth. We're still looking at this. And as I mentioned, we're trying to create a Titan Tumblr 2.0 to address some of the issues that we have. But this is some ongoing work that we're doing and, and moving to the new department at NAU. All right, so we can also investigate aeolian dunes on Titan experimentally. These are some dunes, these, these black lines that stretch diagonally across the image. The black lines here are dunes on Titan. And here are some analog dunes on Earth in Oman and in the Kalahari in Africa. And the idea is that um, we can think about the speed necessary to move these dunes using experiments. The dunes are oriented opposite to what we think are the most common winds. Here's a plot um, of data, of analysis of SAR data, data like this, which suggests that the winds that emplaced the dunes flowed from the west to the east. So they flowed around this knob, for example. And that's what these arrows show down here, arrows pointing from the west to the east. 
But models of Titan's atmosphere suggest that the average wind direction is from the east to the west. So the question is how to reconcile these two. Well, one idea is that if, it's, um, if the dunes only move with the very highest wind speeds, so these average wind speeds are not adequate to move the sand, that there's a much higher wind speed necessary to move the sand, and the sand moves only with those very unusual high wind speeds that might be in the opposite direction, that could help explain this mismatch. So we could explain this mismatch between observations and modeling, that there was a very high threshold or minimum wind speed necessary to move the dunes. So we, um, we sought to investigate that using the Titan One tunnel at the NASA Ames Research Center Planetary Aeolian Lab. And essentially, we took, so this is the Titan Wind Tunnel. This dashed line here is essentially our hypothesis that we're testing. That was a theoretical line from uh, 30 years ago or so, 35 years ago. How well does it hold up? These are the kind of data that we get. We ramp up the wind speed until we see the, dune, until we see the sediment moving. And then we record that wind speed. And we do this for different types of sediment and at different um, densities. And this is what we found. Let's see if I can, all right. So we found that the, the dashed line on the previous plot was not quite the correct line. It needed to be higher. So the minimum threshold wind speed was higher than was predicted. So that supports, and we, we used 23 different combinations of grain size, and density. And so that supported the idea, didn't prove it, but it supported the idea that the mismatch between the average wind speed direction and the wind speed direction inferred from the dune morphology was consistent with the idea that the dunes were moved only by wind speeds during storms or significantly above average. And this um, image shows sort of the interest that nature had in this and also the comparison of the dunes on Titan with the Namib dunes on Earth. All right, so fun observations I mentioned at the beginning are a fundamental aspect of the surface science that we do. This is the Discovery Channel telescope in which NAU is a scientific partner. And we have a number of individuals who use telescopes like the DCT to determine the surface properties of small bodies in our solar system. And um, both asteroids and Kuiper Belt objects, um, people who characterize KBOs using a variety of telescopes, instruments, techniques. And then Chad Trujillo also, who is maybe less interested in the surface properties, but is using the orbits of these different small bodies of, of Kuiper Belt objects specifically to look for an undiscovered outer planet. And this image just shows the discovery of an inner Oort cloud object, not the planet that he's looking for, but shows the kind of technique that he uses. Lastly, spacecraft missions, I mentioned at the beginning, are a growing part of our department. Everyone here knows about the OREX mission to Bennu. We have some people participating in that mission. Um, I mentioned earlier Chris Edwards and, and Mark Salvatore working on the Mars Science Laboratory. And Edwards and Salvatore also work with the Themis data from Mars Odyssey. Looking forward, um, Christina Thomas is the observations working group lead for the DART mission, the double asteroid redirect mission, which is an attempt to deflect an asteroid with a kinetic impact, so planetary protection. Um, Josh Emery is the surface composition working group lead for the Lucy mission to the Trojan asteroids primitive objects in our outer system, outer solar system um, 60 degrees in front of and behind Jupiter, and to help us think about what the early solar system looked like. And, oops, and um, uh, Josh is also working with Amy Meinzer in this department on the NEO Surveyor mission, an infrared space telescope to discover and characterize NEOs. So that's what I have to offer. Um, I uh, appreciate your attention and look forward to working with everybody here. Thank you.
can just, yeah. <laughs> There's a little delay turning it on, but thank you very much. So uh, if people have questions, just put up your hand and I'll be able to come over with the microphone. Yeah, so with respect to the um, fluvial channels on Titan, you showed a map of the ones you had looked at in more detail. I noticed most of those looked like they were towards the equator. And then also um, Huygens landed close to the equator and Dragonfly will be landing close to the equator. So most of the data we would have on that would be close to the equator. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's any worry that um, because of course temperatures and surface materials would be different towards the poles on Titan to some extent. Is there any worry that extrapolating about um, how pebble rounding works to a, a global scale on Titan might not be entirely accurate? Or are there, is there an effort to address that? Great question, thank you, I appreciate that. The poles of Titan is where we see a lot of organic material. So this, um, this feature here on the right side of subfigure A is one of the polar lakes. We see the majority of lakes on Titan at the North Pole. We see a much smaller number, Ontario Lacus, at the South Pole. Um, the lakes have, we think, a, um, both liquid um, methane and ethane in them, as well as organic, maybe solid organic material in them. And that might be what's draping these radar dark channels, radar dark river valleys that we see near the North Pole that feed into these radar dark lakes. So our interest was primarily, or to this point exclusively, in the radar bright fluvial features. So you've asked an excellent question. If our, if our information is biased, and it, it is explicitly biased, we're interested in the radar bright features with, that we think might have these fluvial cobbles in them. With relevance to dragonfly, you've asked another great point. Dragonfly is gonna land in the tropics near the equator and it's gonna hop um, to a crater, we hope, um, and be able to sample along the way. So it absolutely will provide a, a geospatially bi biased sample. Um, I guess the answer there would be that it's a sample though, it's the ground truth, it's sort of you know, it'll be the first ground samples, plural, after the Huygens landing site surface data, the, the DISSER surface data, excuse me, descent imager and spectral radiometer data that came from the surface um, that we have. So it's true, it'll be biased. We, we had that on Mars for a while that we were only landing, when we first started exploring Mars, we were only landing things near the equator. We still sort of have that bias, right? We still don't have anything near the poles on Mars. So I think the an my answer to your question would be, you've raised an excellent point. We will get a bias result, and that's something that's kind of required by the limitations we have and just something that we'll have to think about when we're extrapolating from those data. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you, I think, thank you. Um, I'm not sure I appreciate that question or not. Um, so, um, I don't know, long story or short story? <laughs> so we think that, um, like maybe this image is a little bit better. So um, we think that these features around the margins here show flow from the higher standing plana into what is clearly a, a sedimentary basin here, into a sink, that this was the sink. We've also published that the implication, although not the explicit declaration, that flow along Aeolus Serpens was from the south to the north. And that's largely based on context I can imagine a source of water down here. I just can't imagine a source of water up here as easily. This is also generally downhill, although there's a big bump here where the trace of Aeolus Serpents goes up and over this kind of transverse ridge that has an amplitude of about 100 meters. 
So whichever way it flowed, it had to go over something that was 100 meters. So there's had to have been some post-flow deformation. Um, now, there's been publications by Roman DBAC and his colleagues who have interpreted a feature down here, this pink feature explicitly, that we think was a fan and indicated flow inward. Roman and his colleagues have interpreted that as a delta, and flow was, was outward from this central basin. And then colleagues from the University of Texas um, and Dave Morg's group, um, Ben Cardenas and Corey Hughes, have led papers interpreting some deposits down here as being deltaic deposits. Um, that was Corey Hughes' work interpreted some deltaic facies down here. And Ben Cardenas looked at some of the, the meandering type deposits and said, well, based on the morphology of the meanders, it looks like they were translating down to the southeast. So for those in those locations, here and here, we have publications that suggest flow outward. Um, I'm working on a manuscript right now that I'm eager to show, but just not quite yet, in which I think that we're all right. <laughs> we're all correct. I think there was flow from the highlands from the planet down into the interior. I think at one point there was flow down to the southeast, but I think subsequently there was flow reversal and it went to the northwest or to the north. And my data for that are the um, nighttime thermal infrared data from the Themis instrument that show a fluvial unit that is not mapped on the surface, but that must sit in the shallow subsurface, very shallow subsurface, and we think it outcrops in a few locations. And that shallow subsurface fluvial unit is confined to this area, and it shows branches going off this direction. So what I think that tells me is that there was flow from the plana down into the interior basin, that that inward flow created a fluvial deposit here, that the flow initially was down to the southeast, but that after the basin filled up enough, it was able to breach this divide and it flowed off to the northwest. So that answers for me, I think, still working on this manuscript, but I think it reconciles everything that I've seen published on this area. I think I can get the flow to go all the different directions people have published, which I totally buy their analyses. I'm totally with them. I think they've done great work. And it explains um, what's, what's currently unpublished, which is why there's a, a broad deposit, a broad subsurface fluvial deposit here that otherwise you know, I, I wouldn't be able to explain so well. So, so you've asked a great question. I hope that wasn't TMI, but thanks. Thank you. I'm excited to think more about it. Uh, so the Titan Tumblr 2.0? Yeah. And uh, the 1.0 looked great. I was just curious, um, and I, uh, different relative gravities of the, the bodies are different, but have you thought about uh, trying to um, back out the rates of the sediment um, deflation and, and the size, and size changes and then um, distances, that kind of idea? Thank you. Thanks, Matt, for that great question. I appreciate it. So we think for Titan Tumblr 2.0, um, we're thinking about a barrel and a barrel situation. So here, here we just have one barrel, right? And we think that we're shocking the materials and um, introducing influences from um, when we create the ice and the refrigerator and then we try and cool it in liquid nitrogen before we put it in the barrel, but we think that's introducing planes of weakness in the ice, and so that we're not getting a great result. Um, we think the barrel isn't so great. This is made out of PVC. We've got it sitting in a liquid nitrogen bath, but, but PVC is not conductive. So it's 77 degrees on the outside, Kelvin, but it's not 77 degrees necessarily inside the barrel, right, because the, that um, liquid nitrogen temperature isn't being conducted through. We've tried putting liquid nitrogen in the barrel while we're rolling the cubes. We've done that both intentionally. We started out doing it unintentionally because our barrel leaked. So that was the first time that we did that. Yeah, yeah, it was. 
Oh, but it turned out to be great. We were like, oh, cool. A little bit more realism, the stuff rolling in the liquid nitrogen. Um, but the stuff on Titan is rolling in liquid methane with nitrogen dissolved in it. And methane is, has a higher temperature than liquid nitrogen. So anyway, so there are a few different things that we think are an issue so far. We are trying to, you mentioned getting at distances. So we are trying to get at distances. I don't have that plot to show you, but we have produced plots where the x-axis is distance traveled, sort of angular distance traveled in the tumbler. So thanks for asking that question. We've tumbled things up for distances of two or three kilometers um, and are you know, working on the, the comparison between those distances in the Titan tumbler and distances in, in um, terrestrial tumbling experiments. And again, we're still working on this data, but we, we still think that we're getting more rapid rounding, more rapid in space over, t over distance for the Titan data, the Titan tumbler data, than for the Martian data. Um, did I answer your questions? I got kind of excited and just started talking. Was it, were those what you were asking me? Cool. Thanks. So we have time for one, one last question. Just on that slide as well. Um, so the circularity index that you have, that's in 2D, right? Um, on the vertical axis, that uh, 4 pi a by p square, yeah? Yes. So that's a two-dimensional parameter. Ask the question one more time. Uh, the is that a two-dimensional parameter that you were? Yes, that's using? right. That's right. So it's taking these and taking a photograph of them and putting them in a, an image J script. Um, yeah, I think we wrote the script, or maybe we wrote the script in MATLAB. I guess it's a MATLAB script, actually, that we used. I think we used the same. I think we ended up using the same script that Michael Manga used in this work, so that we knew we were doing a, had an exact comparison.